Amen. Welcome. Bless you. Bless you. Hey, let's take a moment to welcome all of our locations, our family, our friends. And listen, our online church is exploding. There are thousands of people that are logging on and becoming a part of our online community. So would you give them a warm welcome today? God bless you guys. Thanks for being a part. God is doing wonderful things in our hearts and in our lives and in our midst. Father, we are so grateful. Thank you for your goodness that is upon us. The goodness of God is truly leading us to repentance, to changing our minds and the direction of our lives. You are a good God, and we are grateful. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I want to continue where I left off in our last session in regards to being made right by God and how that God has made us right with him. God has offered the sacrifice of his son and and the blood of Jesus has been shed that we might have a relationship with God now. And we've seen in previous messages that God has made peace with us through the blood of his cross. And that God is not angry with any of us. God is not upset. God is not mad. We've even seen how that God is not imputing our sin against us. He's not holding anything against us. And if God has made peace with me and is not angry with me, why would I ever be angry at God? The reason so many people are angry at God is they don't know him. They don't understand how good he's been to them and how much he loves them. And again, me being at peace with God now has equipped me and empowered me to be at peace with you and to be at peace with my fellow man. So the righteousness of God and being made righteous by the blood of Jesus through faith affects every part of our lives. That's why we need to understand this beyond just doctrine. We need to understand righteousness with God and be established in righteousness that we might prevail in all areas of our lives. We need to understand that the work of righteousness will be peace now with God and with each other and this quiet assurance as we walk with God. So this is powerful in every part of our lives. And yet I still run into people, good people at our, our church, good people as I travel now all over, that really don't know how loved they are by God. They don't know how forgiven they are and how God, again, is not imputing any sin to you. That doesn't mean sin doesn't matter now or... Sin it and deadly or dangerous. It means my relationship with God and in my vertical relationship, God is not angry with me. So horizontally now, when I make a mistake, I can run to God and not from God. And so that's what I'm endeavoring to share and to help you with. So let's pick up where I left off. And we're going to talk about grace and mercy in this session. And what great grace has come upon us in Jesus. And how much God has extended mercy to each and every one of us. All right, we ended with this in our last session. For the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. That old covenant system, while it had a place in the kingdom of God, Those sacrifices of the blood of bulls and goats, you having to offer a sacrifice for this kind of sin and a different kind of sacrifice for that kind or type of sin never really made you perfect before God. It didn't change the worshiper's hearts. And he goes on to explain that and what would have happened. He says, for then... Had the worshipers been made perfect by those sacrifices, then would they not have ceased to be offered. But because now that the worshipers once purged should have no more conscience of sins. That if that blood could change your heart and change your conscience before God, they wouldn't have to be offered over and over and over And because they were offered over and over and over, that was a sign that your sins weren't really purged and you weren't changed or made perfect in the presence of God. But look at this. But in those sacrifices, there's a remembrance again made of sin every year for it is not possible. It is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. So all of that Old Testament system 
And the book of Hebrews is comparing the old covenant law to new covenant grace. It's comparing the ministry of a great prophet Moses, but the excellent ministry of the greater prophet Jesus. It's comparing the ministry of the high priest under the old covenant law versus Jesus now, our high priest. It's comparing that blood to Jesus' blood, that temple that was made with men's hands to the temple now that's been made by God, which temple you and I are. Are. And so he's going back and forth. And in this book, he's encouraging Hebrew Christians to go from immaturity as a believer to maturity. How many of you know God didn't save you for you to be stuck in your old ways or your old life? He didn't save you to that you would be just a baby Christian your whole life. He wants you to get saved, yes, and you're a babe in Christ when you first get saved, but he wants you to mature. He wants you to grow and move on to maturity. And this book deals with that. It also, again, deals with the two covenants and the differences between the two covenants and how superior the new covenant is to the old covenant. So the writer of Hebrews is also talking to these Christians not to go back to the law. Don't go back under the types and shadows in your serving of God. Don't go back to the things that are earthly, temporal, and and made by man, but keep coming to Jesus now, the author and finisher of our faith. Keep coming to the new high priest under the New Testament. And so if he wrote that to those Christians, he's writing the same things to us. So now we know Jesus is the antitype of all the types. He's the substance of every shadow that was cast in that Old Testament. And the next few verses just amplify everything I've been endeavoring to say to you over the past few sessions. And so I want to read them to you and just go over what we've been sharing. Because if the sacrifices would have perfected us, they would have ceased to be offered. The first thing you're supposed to think of when that said is, well, wait a minute. There's no offerings under the New Testament being sacrificed. Jesus isn't having to get off the throne and go make another sacrifice or shed his blood or some other type of sacrifice for any sins. So the first thing you're supposed to think of then is, well, maybe us, the worshipers under the New Testament, have been perfected. The fact there's no more sacrifices to offer says you've been perfected. Because he said, had those offerings perfected them, they would have ceased to be offered. Well, they've ceased to be offered because of what Jesus did. So maybe we've been made righteous in the eyes of God. Maybe we've been perfected forever. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> Amen. The worshipers purged, he said, would have no more conscience of sin or a sin consciousness because if there's sacrifice every time you sin you got to go get another sacrifice it just reminds you of your sin it makes you sin conscious maybe the one sacrifice of Jesus is to make you a righteous conscience instead of remembering all your sins now if you sin or fail or fall you need to remember you've been made righteous and run to God not from God Hebrews 1 3 talking about Jesus says when he had by himself purged our sins set down on the right hand of the majesty of high that just said your sins have been purged and my sins have been purged and if your sins have been purged then you've been perfected forever by one sacrifice the body and blood of the Lord Jesus Christ that means I'm forgiven of past sins thank you Jesus that's enough for a Jericho march right there <laughs> I've been forgiven of any present sins where I'm struggling and I'm failing and I'm falling. And I've even been forgiven by one sacrifice for sins forever for anything that might happen in the future as I walk with God. All right, we'll go down to verse 9 because verses 5 through 8 simply talk about Jesus' body and how God prepared a body for Jesus so he could be the ultimate sacrifice for the sins of us all. And he says then, he said, this is Jesus speaking, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first, first what? First covenant, and that he may establish the second. The second is the new covenant or the New Testament. By that will or that testament, the New Testament, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Now you need to remember that. That just said Jesus offered his body one time and in that offering on behalf of every one of us we are sanctified. 
Can you remember that for me? We are sanctified by the offering of the body of Jesus once for all. He doesn't have to keep offering his body or offering blood or shedding more blood. He did it one time for sins forever and that sanctified us. It set us apart. You need to remember that because of the next statement or two. He goes on to say, and every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away our sins. Under the old covenant inferior law, the high priest and the priest would offer all of this blood, all of these different kinds of sacrifices, and they didn't take away our sins. They simply covered them up, is what he's saying. But this man, what man? Jesus our new high priest, this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. Under the old covenant law, the priest couldn't sit down. Why? Sins weren't purged. They weren't taken away. And even the priest knew, as soon as I take your sacrifice and offer it, there's no sense in setting down. Before you get to your tent, you'll be back with another sacrifice. <laughs> because you're not perfected. Your heart wasn't changed. Well, y'all acted like you didn't get that one. <laughs> one sacrifice, four sins forever. Jesus sat down. Why did he sit down? Because that one sacrifice took away our sins and perfected us in the presence of God by his precious blood. Now watch this. From that time waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. The reason you and I have to understand we've been made righteous in the eyes of God through the blood of Jesus. We've been perfected and our sins have been purged. And Jesus says, sit down at the right hand of God because what he did was more than enough and nothing else will ever have to be done between me and God and dealing with my sins and now extending his forgiveness for me. The reason I have to understand that is Jesus Jesus is waiting and expecting till all our enemies are made his footstool. You can't overcome all the enemies of this life that war against you, dear ones, if you don't know how perfected you are in the eyes of God, if you don't know how forgiven you are, if you don't know how cleansed you are, and how that your sins have been purged, and that God is on your side, he's not against you, he's fighting for you, and you need to overcome every enemy of this life. Too many of us are being overcome by the enemies of this life because we don't know who we are in Christ. We don't know. We've been made the very righteousness of God and that God is not holding anything against us or imputing anything to us. He loves us so much. And only with God can I overcome the enemy of unforgiveness toward others in my life. Only with God can I overcome bitterness and anger and wrath and envy and jealousy and slander and backbiting, and sickness, and does it, these, y'all better nod your head pretty soon, or I'll just <laughs> attack every enemy that's warring against you, that will rule over you, if you don't know your new position in Christ, and that God is not only for you, he is with you to never leave or forsake you, to fight on your behalf against all these enemies. And ultimately, the last enemy, death, is going to be put under ours and Jesus' feet. There's a day coming that Jesus will appear and his kingdom. And we will be caught up in the air, those of us that are alive. And our bodies will absolutely be changed. And mortality will put on immortality. Corruption that's working in my flesh will put on incorruption and death the last enemy by the whole body of Christ at one time will be overcome and everybody that has died will be raised from the dead and will dance in the air over the last enemy death that will be defeated and swallowed up by Jesus the good news is while we're headed to that last enemy's defeat we're supposed to be defeating every enemy we encounter and if you know you're forgiven and if you know God is for you and if you know God has nothing to do with that enemy in your life, you can fight a good fight now of faith. You can overcome any sin of your past. You can overcome sickness. You can overcome disease now. You can overcome depression. You can overcome oppression. You can overcome being mean. <laughs> do you know, it's amazing when you see how forgiven you are 
truly by the Spirit and how perfected you've been made in your spirit, man, and how righteous you stand before God, it is so easy to forgive other people. I remember when it used to be hard to forgive, and right now, it is so easy to forgive people of just horrible stuff that people have done to me. And the reason I can forgive so freely and so easily is I know how forgiven I am. If God has forgiven me of my past, if God's forgiven me of the weaknesses of my flesh right now and the struggles I have in my own life right now, and he's, he's extending forgiveness toward me, and if he's already promised that one sacrifice covered sin forever, and that anything in the future that I may fail in or fall in, the forgiveness of God will be available to me, how could I hold anything against you? If God's not mad at me, I don't need to be mad at him or anybody else now by this same grace. This is powerful when you begin to see it and how it works in your everyday life. One of the things that did bless me abundantly, I'm so excited about this, is I made a statement a couple of weeks ago that in the past, I could feel the pushback. I could feel opposition to what I said. I didn't feel one ounce of pushback when I said it. Not everybody agreed with it. Not everybody thought it was possible or I was probably right, but there wasn't opposition or pushback. I made the statement a couple of weeks ago that years ago, the Lord has spoke to me and he said, Dwayne, I have never, ever been displeased with you. Can you imagine being in a place of understanding the cross and the blood and the grace of God that God is never, ever displeased with you? I guarantee you most of you don't believe that because you don't have a revelation of righteousness by faith. You're not established in righteousness. You're not letting the work of righteousness create this peace between you and God so that you can be at peace with everybody in your life now. And yet, even when God said that to me, I, I hesitated. I, it arrested me that, okay, now I know you don't get mad at me if I fail or fall. You won't punish me if I fail or fall. But are you saying to me you're not displeased with me even when I fall down? How could God be displeased with me? He's pleased with my faith. And I don't know about you, but when I sin or if I sin, I don't renounce my faith. It's my faith that causes me to get back up, run straight to God that pleases him. And yet I'm telling you, God has never been displeased with you. And I'm telling you, he's pleased with you right now. Well, God can't be pleased with me. <laughs> Nobody else is pleased with me. I know how that feels because as soon as God said that, I thought, how could that be? Sue loves me more than anybody. And she's been displeased with me a time or two <laughs> this morning. <laughs> My children have never, ever said they've ever been displeased with me. But you can't raise children and invoke discipline and have to train and teach them in the kingdom of God and them not get frustrated with you as a parent or displeased with you. So I'm sure my children at times were displeased with me. I've had friends that were displeased with me. I think the church at times has been displeased with me. But I'm telling you, I stand before God Almighty right now, cleansed and washed of all of my sin. I stand before God Almighty, purged of all sin, perfected, made righteous forever by the offering of the body and blood of Jesus. One time for sin, forever. Hallelujah. God's pleased with my faith. And because I know he's so pleased with me and doesn't turn on me, when I do something dumb, I can run to him, not from him now. I can run to him, not from him. He's waiting on all my enemies to become his footstool. Watch this. Here it is again. For by one offering, he has perfected forever those who are being what? What did I tell you to remember? That the body of Jesus being offered for you sanctified you in the eyes of God. Now he's saying those that are sanctified, he's perfected forever. But the Holy Spirit, I like this, the Holy Spirit also is a witness to us. Jesus is a witness to righteousness by faith and that God loves me now unconditionally and won't impugn any sin against me. The Bible is a witness of this amazing grace and great mercy. Now the Holy Ghost is a witness. Here's the Holy Spirit in his witness that's for us. He said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds I will write them. Look at this. Then he adds, their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. 
God doesn't remember my sin. He remembers even when I sin what Jesus did to pay the price for that. He remembers the sacrifice of his son on behalf of me for all my sins. He remembers he poured his wrath out on Jesus for all my sins so he could be merciful to me. God remembers the cross. God remembers the blood. God remembers and has the son sitting on his right hand reminding him on my behalf that I am a forgiven man and I've been made the righteousness of God perfected forever in the presence of God. Wow. That is over the top good news. Over the top powerful and every believer needs to understand this. Because everything in your life is connected to a revelation of this righteousness by faith. He goes on to say, now there and now where there is remission of these, there is no longer an offering for sin. The reason there's no more offerings as we assemble together as the people of God is the one offering Jesus made was for sin forever and our sins have been remitted they're like in remission on God's end I'm not saying sin it and deadly horizontally I'm not saying there aren't consequences to sin I'm not saying there aren't wages still and the law of sowing and reaping I'm saying from God's viewpoint of us his people he's not mad at us he's not against us he's literally remitted our sin it's like if you had cancer and you went through radiation and the doctor says it's in remission that doesn't mean it's gone it doesn't mean there's no such thing as cancer and it's a an alien thing now that's foreign and nowhere near your life it's saying it's not killing you anymore it has no power over you anymore it's not producing death in your life if I sin sin is deadly and I'm gonna teach you how to deal with it as I progress through all of these different teachings but God has remitted it meaning he's not holding it against me and he's not mad at me and he's not gonna kill me now and punish me because of my mistakes hallelujah and yet we got preachers that don't understand what I'm saying much less the body of Christ at large every time something bad happens to you some of you think it could be God Man, I wish I could spend time on this, but this thought came to me earlier. Even in the law of sowing and reaping, a lot of people accept the death that comes with sowing and reaping as if that's God's way still of punishing you. That you have been bad, you did some bad things, you sowed a bad seed, so now you have to reap all the death, and that's a form of God even still punishing you. God's not punishing you even through the law of sowing and reaping. The Bible says, do not be deceived, God won't be mocked. Whatsoever a man sows, he'll reap, and if you sow to your flesh, listen, you'll of your flesh reap corruption. Not God! But if you sow to the Spirit, you'll love the Spirit, or of God, reap eternal life now. Did you know one of the things I do for you, you won't know how good I've been to you till you get to heaven. Because one of the things I do is pray the remission of sin over the church constantly, and I pray over you crop failure for all the bad seeds that you've sown. Man, the minute you turn to God, even if you've been sowing a bad seed, and now the harvest is coming in, God can pull that crop up, soften your heart, and put the right seed in there to reap good things in your life now speedily. Man, I pray crop failure over a lot of you. There's a lot of you that have come to me and have told me what you've done, and I'm ducking. It's like, dude, you have sown to a lot of bad stuff, and you, if you don't change, can reap a lot of death. But God can reverse that crop. It's like the Holy Spirit over your life could be like poison over bad seeds and kill every weed in your life and cause rain from heaven to come to your heart after repenting even and good seeds now to be put in there and reap a good harvest really fast and so I wish I could really expound on that maybe later we'll look at that too but he says after saying this one sacrifice has perfected us forever therefore brethren having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus the holiest intimacy with God coming into the unveiled presence of God the holiest of holy because of Jesus he says by a new and a living way which he consecrated for us through the veil now look at this that is his flesh 
And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with true heart in full assurance of faith. Not of our flesh, not of ourselves, of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. When Jesus died on the cross, dear ones, he bore my sins and your sins and God punished him, poured his wrath out on Jesus and all the curses of that Old Testament law. And when Jesus died and said it was finished, and he went to the grave when he was raised from the dead on the third day watch this when he's raised from the dead he didn't go into the temple on the earth made with man's hands he didn't go behind the veil of that temple that veiled and shut off the people of God from the unveiled presence of God in that Old Testament temple there was an outer court that Jews and Gentiles believers and unbelievers could pursue God and begin to seek God then there was a holy place that only the priests could go into there and the Jews and they would offer sacrifices to God again for their sins continually but there was one area of the tabernacle or the tent even of Moses that was called the holy of holies and there was this thick veil that separated God's Shekinah glory his unveiled presence from the people of God only the high priest could go back there one time a year to offer blood for the sins of the entire nation. That's where the Ark of the Covenant was. That's where the gold box, if you will, that had the Ten Commandments in it, the rod of, of Aaron that budded, and the manna that came down from heaven was in that box, that Ark of the Covenant. And there were two cherubim angels that faced each other over that box, the top of that box, and there was a mercy seat. That high priest would put the blood of bulls and goats on that mercy seat and then have to get past that veil back to the people. The veil separated God from the unveiled presence of God. The Bible says when Jesus was raised from the dead, listen, the veil in the temple made with hands was ripped from the top to the bottom by an angel signifying that the way to holy God was made available to people that aren't perfect after the flesh. And how is that veil now in the heavens of heavens. Just like there was something, a veil that separated the people from God's presence and unveiled full presence, Jesus is the veil in heaven between us and God. And when you come to the Father God, even when you've sinned or you've made a mistake and you're bringing it to God, you come through the veil of the flesh of Jesus into the Holy of Holies without spot or wrinkle or guilt or shame and you are accepted in the very presence of God Almighty because of the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. Man, I wish somebody would have told me that years ago sitting in church feeling like I was still separated from God and I was flawed and all of my mistakes how could God really have much to do with me and yet God has extended such grace to me and such mercy to me in this man Jesus and he stands as the mediator between me and the Father God now ever living to make intercession for me. If or when I sin, I run straight to Jesus. And Jesus has a face-to-face -face relationship with God the Father. And when I'm coming in there even with a weakness or a sin or a mistake or falling or failing, Jesus looks at the Father and says, I covered that. I paid for that. You poured all your wrath out on me for that. You punished me for that. You turned on me for that, and now you are faithful to extend nothing but mercy to this member of my body on the earth. Hallelujah. That right there is good, good news, because we all fail. We all fumble the ball. We all make mistakes, but we can draw near to God. This is a prayer that Paul prayed. I've got to read it. I've done it every service, and I keep thinking, well, cut that short because I keep running out of time. But this prayer is incredible. And in the Passion Translation, you need to learn this prayer and pray it for yourself. Pray it for your families. I pray it over you, the church, Sue and I, on a regular basis. The Passion Translation just really opens it up. Paul says, since the first I heard about you, we've, we've kept you always in our prayers. Remember, a prayer that's recorded in the Bible is anointed by God. It's as anointed today as it was 2,000 years ago. And so here's the prayers that he prayed, that you would receive the perfect knowledge of God's pleasure over your lives. <laughs> Y'all didn't get that? Isn't that awesome? He's praying that you would know, have a perfect knowledge of God and his pleasure over your life. God's pleased with you. 
through your faith in Jesus, making you reservoirs of every kind of wisdom and spiritual understanding. We're supposed to be containers and expressors of this glory, containers and expressors of the wisdom of God. You're not just to be blessed with this. You're to be a blessing everywhere you go. Can you imagine if you really believed all of this stuff and how righteous you were and perfected forever and that God loves you unconditionally? What a breath of fresh air you would be everywhere you go. Now, one of the things I want to minister on, there's so many things, but I want to minister again on the Holy Spirit and the power of the gifts of the Holy Spirit and the power of being baptized with the Holy Spirit because it's almost like the church is still stuck on even the Holy Spirit is for selfish gain. And all this power is for self-attention and and to be demonstrative and show out and off and on and on it goes. It's like this whole culture is obsessed with self. And, and the church has been affected by this. It's like everybody's taking a selfie of themselves as they fall off a cliff. <laughs> so self-centered. The reason we need to be baptized with the Holy Ghost and immersed in the Holy Ghost is to be a witness everywhere we go. You're supposed to be blessed to be a blessing now. He says, I pray this for you. We pray that you would walk in the ways of true righteousness, pleasing God in every good thing you do. Then you'll become fruit-bearing branches, yielding to his life and maturing in the rich experience of knowing God in his fullness. And we pray that you would be energized with all the explosive power from the realm of his magnificent glory, filling you with great hope. I don't care what you're facing, you should always have hope in God. Maybe you're even struggling with your faith and something's happened and you can't get a breakthrough and you're struggling. You should always have hope in Jesus. He is the anchor of hope in our lives. That in the worst case scenario that we face is death, the last enemy to be put under our feet. And even if we face death, how many of you know for you to live is Christ and you to die is gain? That even in death, you come out of your body and you're with Jesus. Man, that doesn't sound so bad right now with some of the things I'm going through. <laughs> we need to always have hope, great hope in Jesus. Your hearts can soar with joyful gratitude when you think of how God made you worthy to receive the glorious inheritance freely given to us by living in the light. Everything we have is by the grace of God freely given. How could we not be excited about God and filled with joy and happiness? If we understood this, he says he's rescued, rescued us completely from the tyrannical rule of darkness. One of my favorite statements in the Passion Translation, the tyrannical rule of darkness. Then before Jesus comes into our life, the devil uses sin and tyranny of sin over our lives. Jesus has broke the tyranny of sin off of our lives. We don't have to sin anymore. We do sin. We we are falling short, but the power of it's been broke and the tyranny of it and has translated us into the kingdom realm of his beloved son. Then he says, here's where I want to go. <laughs> For in the son, all our sins are what? Canceled. How many of your sins are canceled? All. all sins are canceled and we have the release of redemption through his very blood, because of the blood of Jesus, my sins have been canceled. It doesn't mean if I sin against you today, I don't deal with that, or it doesn't matter, or it's okay to sin now. It means from God's end, he's canceled the debt. He's canceled our sin against us because of the blood of Jesus. Not so we can celebrate sin and live in sin, but so we can break the power of sin off of our lives now. Amen. Amen. We're forgiven. Our sins are are canceled. In Psalms 103, David is celebrating the forgiveness he found under the law that I ministered to you out of Romans chapter 4, verses 6 through 8, a few sessions ago. We talked about how David, under the old covenant law, found New, Te New Testament grace. Under the old covenant law, if you have an affair or you commit adultery, there was no sacrifice you could offer. You were to be stoned by two or three witnesses under the law. Under the law, there was no sacrifice you could offer for murder. It was a capital, a capital offense. And David not only committed murder, he used a hired staff member, one of his generals, to assassinate a man so he could cover up his adultery and his affair. That's just horrible what he did. 
And there's a psalm he wrote one time where he said, Man, if there was an offering I could offer, I would offer it. But you're not asking for offerings of bulls and goats. But a broken and contrite spirit would be acceptable to you. He repented of his sin, found grace and mercy. And now he's celebrating it in Psalms 103. You need to read the whole psalm. It's exciting. And I mean, he's, he's just thrilled with the goodness of God because he experienced it. He says, Bless the Lord, O my soul. Soul, dumb head, bless God. Sometimes you got to talk to your head and your head forgets how much God loves you. It forgets how forgiven you are. It forgets how good God's been to you. So you have to talk to your soul. He says, soul, you bless the Lord and all that is within me bless his holy name. Uh, bless the Lord, oh my soul. He's talking to his soul. And don't forget or forget not all of his benefits. Look at this. Who forgiveth how many of your iniquities and heals how many of your diseases? Man, we've forgotten these things. I talk to Christians all the time and they have forgotten. God's forgiven you of all your sins. He's healed you of all your diseases. We need to fight a good fight of faith knowing these things and being assured of. And he, he redeems your life from destruction. Who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies. Verse 10. He has not dealt with us. This is David talking. Under the law. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. Are you kidding me? Under the old covenant law, when they appealed to law, God did punish them for their sins. I'll cover all that in our next series. God did curse them with a curse when they rebelled against him and when they lived after the flesh and after the law versus after faith. And yet David is saying, he's not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to... Where'd it go? <laughs> Y'all are antsy now because I've been chopping the TV. My bad. Be cool. Wait on me. He says he's not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. How many Christians under New Testament grace, how many preachers have not figured out God's not punishing us for our iniquities? God's not holding our mistakes against us. God's not being mad at us and mean to us and hurting us and making us sick and on and on I could go. And yet I'm just going to keep pounding the Word of God into your thick skulls <laughs> that God loves you and God is for you and not against you. He says as far as the heavens or as, high, as the heavens are high above the earth so great is His mercy. Everybody say mercy toward those who fear Him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As far as the east is from the west. East and west never meet. It's forever that way and forever that way. And that's how far God's removed all of our sins from us. Man, this is powerful. Maybe I'm still preaching to me, but I am so thankful to God. I'm so happy. I'm so blessed. I'm nothing but a blessing everywhere I go. Because I know God loves me and I know he loves you. Well, I've messed up. I know. Let's fess up and get it right. Let's get it fixed. <laughs> Numbers chapter 23. I don't have time for it now. Please put it in your notes. I'm so disappointed on my timelines. But Numbers 23 is one of the most difficult characters in the Bible for me. And that's Balaam. Balaam and his relationship with Balak, a king of the Moabites, that was afraid of the Israelites and being conquered by them. So Balak literally hired Balaam to curse the children of Israel, to speak a curse on them. And again, I don't understand Balaam. It appears he knows the true and the living God because he's hearing from God and he speaks on God's behalf. But he's like a soothsayer of his day. He's a corrupt prophet. He's a backslidden man that the gifts and calling are without repentance. So he hears God, but he's corrupt. And Balak's trying to pay him to curse God's people. And so he offers sacrifices to God and asks God, could he do it? And God said, no, you can't curse my people. And in Numbers chapter 23, he says, I have blessed my people and it cannot be reversed. You go tell Balak that there is nobody on earth that can curse these people. I have blessed them and it cannot be reversed. And it says, Balaam spoke to Balak 
in the name of God and said, God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he not said it and shall he not make it good? Hath he not spoken it and it not come to pass? And then it says, God has blessed and it cannot be reversed and he has not beheld iniquity in Jacob nor seen perverseness in Israel. And then it says there was the shout of a king among them. And the question, look at what God has done. It wasn't that they didn't have any sin among them. And it wasn't that there wasn't any perverseness among them. They were responding to God by faith. And God canceled out all their iniquities and didn't see them in sin. Saw his divine purpose for their life and brought it to pass. Hallelujah. What do you think God sees in your life? How do you think God sees you? He sees you united to Jesus. He sees you washed in the blood. He sees you as one that he will remember your sins and iniquities no more. And I promise you, says God, I tell you, I seal it in the blood of my son that I will be merciful to your unrighteousness and your sins and iniquities I will remember no more, says God. Hallelujah. Man, that excites me. I need to quit, but years ago, let me give one story. Years ago, we were still in the double wide trailer when the church first started. And man, we were poor. We were so poor we couldn't pay attention. It was terrible days. And so we were believing God, and I remember the church praying together, and we're going to pave, or not pave, we didn't have that kind of money. We're going to put rocks in the parking lot because of all the mud on the five acres that was here and that's still here, but I mean, it had a double wide trailer on it. And so anyway, we believe God for that. We bought those rocks. We, we put all those rocks out. And one Sunday night after church, I'm coming out into the parking lot. Jeremy was six years old. Jacob was four. And both my boys were standing there with their po pockets bulging full of rocks. And they were throwing rocks at cars. How many of you know that's not how you build a healthy church? Growing people in Christ. That's not going to help the tithes and offerings. I mean, we're running people. My boys, the preacher's kid is throwing rocks. And so I was clear with them. And one of the things I learned early in life, many people discipline their children and they produce anger in their children and wrath in their children because they're not clear and their children don't understand something. So I was very clear with the kids always when they messed up. So I looked at the two boys and I said, do you understand this isn't right? You can't throw rocks at cars. Yeah, daddy, we understand. Do you understand these churches, these rocks belong to the church. That's stealing. You can't put them in your pocket and carry them home. We bought these rocks. Do you understand their consequences to sin and that I'll have to invoke consequences if you do this again. If you eat of this tree, you will surely die. <laughs> do you understand? Yes, daddy, we understand. We'll never do it again. And poor Jacob, I feel so sorry for him. He's only four, but he was smart, smart. And he had this worship of his older brother going. Now he's gotten over it. I can tell you that for sure. <laughs> but whatever his brother did, he would do it. He would follow, if Jeremy was to go straight to hell, Jacob would have followed him right to the gates <laughs> of hell itself. And so Jacob's kind of just being drugged into it, but he still knew what he was doing. And so I said, we're not going to do it anymore. That's right. Next Sunday night after church, I walk out. My boys are standing in the parking lot. Their pockets are bulging with rocks that they stole from the church. And they still had the follow through going with what just happened as a car was leaving. <laughs> boy. I walked over to him. I said, boys and boy. I mean, they knew they had sinned and come short of the glory of dad. <laughs> and they started crying and boiling up with tears. And it was King Saul. Sorry you got caught. Not true repentance from your heart. So I said, boys, that ain't going to work. You can cry all you want, but you get in the car. And when we get home, we're going to have to deal with this. And the parsonage was just right around the corner. And so they're sobbing in the back. Boy, they knew judgment day was coming. And so we're headed for the house. We're going into the house, and I'm talking to them, trying to make sure they understand. And just as I walked in the house, I flipped the light on, and I said, boys, what do we need? And I expected the right answer because they've been taught. I've taught them. And I expected we need disciplines, we need to understand boundaries, we need to understand the law of sowing and reaping because our lives are going to be a wreck if we don't understand cause and effect. It's called parenting. Try it, maybe some of you, it's unreal. 
I expected that answer. And so I said, boys, what do we need? And I flipped the light on and Jeremy was just crying. And he said, daddy, I need mercy. <laughs> And poor little Jacob, he's crying. He went, yeah, mercy. And he was so smart. I don't know where he got all of his smarts or his intellect, but he started appealing. He said, yeah, we need to appeal to a higher court of justice. And maybe if God will be merciful, you can find it in your heart, Dad, to be merciful. <laughs> it's like, shut up. I'm going to beat you for this. What are you talking about? Appeal to a higher court. Where you learn at four years old language like that? <laughs> and so I thought, I, 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 I turned the light off and laughed. And I didn't want them to see me laughing because I'm, I'm, I'm serious about this. And I flipped the light back on and I said, all right, Jeremy, mercy. Now watch this. He's six years old. Never, ever think your children aren't listening even when you think they're not. I said, all right, Jeremy, what is mercy? He said, daddy, Mercy is when you don't get what you deserve. Amen. Let me tell you what grace is. Grace is when you get what you don't deserve. Yeah. Mercy is when you don't get what you deserve. And I said, well, what do we deserve? And boy, Jacob's going, yeah, tell him, tell him, Bubba. <laughs> what, what do we deserve? And Jeremy said, we, we deserve to be disciplined. We deserve a spanking. And I don't even know how I worked it out looking back, but I wiggled and squirmed and I extended as much mercy as humanly possible and not break my word to them. But I tell you, if a six-year-old can understand mercy, why can't adults today understand God's mercy? You're not getting what you deserve. Welcome to mercy. I said I would quit, but I got to give you a passage. I repent for lying right in the presence of God. First John 1, 9 into chapter 2, and I promise we're going to quit. Look at this. But if we freely admit our sins as Christians now, we didn't confess our sins to get saved. We confess Jesus as Lord to get saved. Now that we have a Lord that has provided forgiveness, we can go to him and receive that forgiveness if or when we sin. He says we freely admit our sins when his light uncovers them. As you walk with God, he'll show you that's not right. But don't run from him. Run to him because he's already paid the price. He will be faithful to forgive us how many times every time God is just to forgive what kind of language is that in me coming to God for forgiveness just to forgive us our sins why because of Christ and he will continue to cleanse us from all unrighteousness it didn't even say he would be merciful to us it said he would be faithful and just why is God faithful and just to forgive me if I ever come to him with a sin he's already forgiven me in Jesus and I'm just going to receive that forgiveness now as I walk with him if we claim that we're not guilty of sin when God uncovers it with his light, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Now, here's where we're going to quit. He says, you're my dear children and I write these things so that you won't sin. But if anyone does sin, we continually have a forgiving redeemer who is face to face with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. And he is the atoning sacrifice, the living atoning sacrifice for how, how, how many sins? All of our sins, for our sins. And not only for ours, but for the sins of the whole world. Man, I'm quitting, I promise, I'm quitting. Give me, give me, give me 20 seconds, I'm quitting. I have said all of these things about how your sins are purged, you're righteous and truly holy, and you're spirit man, you're forgiven, and you have total access into the presence of God. I said all of these things that you sin not. I didn't say all of these things so we could have a sin party, so we could celebrate, so we could hurt one another and harm one another and commit things that hurt ourselves and hurt each other. I shared all of these things that you sin not. But if we sin... We've got a lawyer at the right hand of God. We've got an advocate at the right hand of God. We've got Jesus seated 
face to face with the father that when I bring him any mistake, he looks at the father and says, I paid for that. I bore your wrath for that. And you promised to be merciful to them. Then Jesus turns to the Holy Spirit and says, Holy Spirit, would you comfort my brother? Will you comfort a member of my very body on the earth? Will you encourage them to get up? Will you encourage them and heal them of that hurt? And will you empower them not only to get up, but to learn from it, to not keep repeating it, and to learn from it so you can help others not repeat that mistake? Amen. Father, I thank you that you've written all these things in a book, the Bible. You've empowered me by the Holy Spirit to say these things. Not that we would sin, but that we would break the power of sin through your presence in our lives, your goodness, your mercy. Thank you for grace, and I'm getting so much that I don't deserve. And thank you for your mercy that keeps me from getting what I do deserve. I am one very grateful member of your church. I pray that for our church. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Praise the Lord.